So I want to begin by saying the theme of my talk is that it is possible to transform the international financial system, the thing that we call globalization. And um, I know that that probably sounds daunting uh, to most people, and it also may sound ridiculous. But if we think and if we are convinced and if scientists are convinced that we have to transform the ecosystem, then it is of necessity for us to trans transform the economic system that has produced the current unstable and dangerous and imbalanced global ecosystem. Uh, if we want to change that, then we have to change the economic system and in particular, the thing that underpins the economic system, the financial system. And, you know, there are people on the streets assuring us that we can change the ecosystem, that we can uh, end emissions and that we can save humanity, that we can end the crisis of biodiversity, uh, that we can move and change before we face extinction. If we have confidence to do that, then we must have confidence to tackle Wall Street, the city of London and Frankfurt, to, to put it crudely. And um, I want to say, you know, it is entirely possible. And the reason I know is because we've done it before. Um, we did it when I say we, uh, Western societies, Western governments did it back in the 1930s and in particular, in 1945, when they drafted and designed a new international system, a new financial international financial architecture, which they called Bretton Woods, right, or which came to be called Bretton Woods. But even earlier, in 1933, President Roosevelt faced two major and un unexpected, well, not unexpected, two major Transform, tra transformative crises. The first crisis was the crisis of the failure of the economy, the failure of the capitalist economy in the United States, the collapse of Wall Street, uh, the bankruptcy of all sorts of corporations, the massive unemployment, um, the levels of unemployment, uh, the, the degree of dissent and unhappiness there was in the countryside, the failure of agriculture, the failure of agricultural prices, the fact that farmers were burning their farmsteads rather than growing anything. So that was one challenge that this president elected in 1933 with an enormous mandate and against the will of Wall Street. He'd come up in the primary uh, in preparing to be the candidate for the Democrats. He'd come up against a Wall Street candidate and a Wall Street candidate that was very well financed. Uh, and he defeated that Wall Street candidate to win the, the Democratic candidacy for the presidency. That in itself was a huge hurdle. And then he became president. And the thing he faced was the collapse of the global financial system effectively. And he understood and knew it well because in 1929, he was the governor of New York. He sat inside New York as 5,000 banks failed and as unemployment rose dramatically. He witnessed it all very directly. It wasn't as if he was sitting in an ivory tower somewhere. He was in the city. He was governor of the city, right? So that was his one huge crisis he faced. The other huge crisis he faced was an ecological crisis. It was called the Dust Bowl. It was caused by excessive exploitation of the land. It was caused by the fact that soil had eroded because of overuse of the soil. Um, the result was the infertility of the soil across large swathes of the United States. The Great Plains had all dried out and had effectively become unfertile. The consequence of that collapse of that ecosystem was the mass migration of thousands of people away from Oklahoma and those Great Plains states and towards, for example, California, where they hope to get jobs. So we, he had this huge up, you know, population upheaval, as well as this dramatic ecological crisis. So like us today, he faced these twin crises not on the scale that we face today, 
our crises are far greater. Uh, but nevertheless, he faced two crises. And on the night, first of all, in his speech, in his inaugural speech, he was very clear about what the problem was. He was very clear that the problem was Wall Street. It was the greed of the of the of the world's bankers and financiers. And his 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 inaugural speech was scathing. I do recommend, if you have a moment, that you look it up and read it. It was really a huge attack on the financial sector and their greed and their ability not to be able to solve problems, but simply to pile more credit onto a deflated and, and, and weakened economy. And after his speech, he went back to the White House. This was his first night at the White House. And that night, he began the process of dismantling Wall Street. And he did this by saying that Wall Street would no longer determine the value of the currency, and they wouldn't value the currency relative to gold. And he wanted to demand straight away that Wall Street and all the banks hand over their gold to the Treasury and that the determination of the exchange rate was going to be made by an elected government's treasury officials and, and the president. Now, you can imagine that was pretty damn radical stuff to do on the night of your inauguration. He discussed this with his team. And if you want more to know more about that, then I suggest an amazing history of that period by Eric Rochway, the American historian. Um, he discussed this with his advisors and they said, well, hang on a minute, you can't do that tonight or tomorrow. And he said, why not? And they said, well, tomorrow is a Sunday. It's a holy day. The banks are closed. Everything is closed. You're going to have to wait till Monday. And so he reluctantly agreed to wait until Monday. And on early Monday morning, they closed the banks across Wall Street. And he began the demand that the banks hand over their gold. And with that process began something which his treasury secretary, who was Henry Morgenthau, explained in this way. He said, we moved the financial capital from London and Wall Street right to my desk at the treasury, right? In other words, the power, the government of the financial system was moved from the private sector, from the private finance sector in Wall Street to the public, publicly accountable and democratic government that had just been elected. And, you know, I can just imagine what the bankers thought. And of course, there's plenty of uh, written evidence of what they thought. They were pretty pissed off. But the fact of the matter was, they also understood that they were in a very, very weak position. They had no bargaining power relative to the president because of the weakness of the economy, because the failure of their own institutions, because of the failure of the economic orthodoxy that had, had been at the root of the crisis. And so they conceded in a way that I don't think they would easily do today, but nevertheless, they did. And from there on, he, he, he began, and he wasn't perfect. He made some very big errors. He made very, he was quite conservative. He was not exactly a radical, he, you know, he was an aristocrat had come from, uh, you know, effectively the aristocratic elite of the United States. But he did understand the monetary system and he did understand the financial sector's role in the crisis, in the Great Depression. And, you know, he was progressive. He wanted to address those problems. He wanted to create jobs. He wanted to finance the arts. He wanted to restore stability to the United States, as well as to the ecological system, to the ecosystem. And he made very big mistakes. I'm not here to hero worship Roosevelt. For a start, he set up, for example, the civilian core of, of people, he mobilized unemployed workers to go and work the land, to go and plant trees, to deal with soil erosion. And on a big scale, massive scale, that this recruitment was like recruiting an army. But there were two weaknesses to his recruitment. Number one, he wouldn't have black people in the call. And secondly, despite the pressure his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, placed on him, he wouldn't have women in there. Women had to be at home looking after the children. So this man wasn't exactly a left-wing radical, right? But he did understand his main preoccupation was the creation of jobs for working people and the restoration of economic stability and ecological stability to his country. And he achieved that. 
when he died at his funeral, the crowds were the biggest crowds there ever were. And he, he was he was reelected regularly and with enormous majorities. He was enormously popular with the American people. And he was hated by Wall Street. And he made a very fiery speech one day in which he said, I welcome their hatred. So that's for you to explore and, and, and read more about. And again, I, I recommend Eric Rochway. But what that teaches us is that the financial system isn't a construction that is beyond the reach of human intelligence and that we can't do anything about it. We have the sense of powerlessness in relationship to the finance sector, A, because they are so powerful, um, you know, and B, because their power is invisible. You know. um, when we watch a, a wicked dictator, we can see them exercising power in quite a tangible way. Can't see Wall Street exercising power. Um, you can't see London exercising power. It's all entirely invisible. It, it, it happens out there in a stratosphere beyond the reach of regulatory democracy. And um, it's, it's in activity which is largely digital um, and invisible to the rest of us. And that's not an accident, it's designed that way, right? Um, but that's not to say that the, the system is all powerful. And we know that from 2007, eight, and I, I don't need to rehearse the crisis of 2007, eight. You all know about it and you all know how Wall Street was rescued by the public banks. I know that David asked you to read my article um, about uh, you know, our ability to exercise power over the finance sector. And I hope that you have been able to read it so that I don't have to repeat myself too much. But um, the fact of the matter is that uh, in 2007, eight, Wall Street and many of the banks, the financial institutions, the asset management funds, the hedge funds that are dominant there would have been smashed to pieces without a public rescue from the publicly owned and publicly backed uh, Federal Reserve uh, central, and the Bank of England and the ECB and the Bank of Japan, to name but a few of the central banks that rode to the rescue of these private free marketeers. Right. And let's remind ourselves that free market ideology is that those who engage in the free market take risks. And if their risks succeed, then it is entirely correct and rational for them to be rewarded for those risks. And if those risks, those rewards are massive profits and massive capital gains, so be it, because they took the risk. Right. However, if in taking risks they fail, they must make losses. And the reason why free market ideology argues for losses is that losses discipline the market, teaches the market not to go there again, not to, do, not to repeat the same errors, to learn from that experience. And so the, the question of losses and the disciplining of, the mar of markets by losses is fundamental to free market ideology, but it no longer exists, right? Currently, the way the financial system operates is to say, is to argue essentially, we will not make losses. We do not want to make losses. We will not take risks. We want to be what is now called in the language of the IMF and the World Bank. We want to be de-risked. We will only invest in Africa. We will only plant trees across the Sahel if that, that risk is de-risked by taxpayers that back up the World Bank, the IMF, the Federal Reserve, and so on. Otherwise, we're not willing to take that risk, right? So we've now got a new kind of ideology, which is uh, people acting beyond regulatory boundaries, uh, so-called free marketeers, who at the same time demand public guarantees, public backups, and public bailouts. And we know that happened in 2007, eight, but few of us know the extent to which the Federal Reserve bailed out the private financial system in March 2020, 2020. The failure of capital markets in, 20, in March 2020 was far more grave 
and far more systemic and far more potentially devastating than it was in 2007-8. And that, that is barely understood by the, by the public at large. You know, we, were all, we were all fixated by something called the coronavirus. Uh, we were all terrified by it because it, it's a killer virus, right? And so the public was completely diverted away from what was happening in Wall Street. Um, but in the late weeks of February and early March 2020, the treasuries market, the US treasuries market, which is the market in US bonds, essentially, uh, and uh, short term bonds, treasury bills, as well as, as long term bonds, um, collapsed, it failed. And that is unheard of, right? And the reason it was unheard of was that it is a vast market. It's a market made up of $20 trillion of financial assets, of bonds, $20 trillion. It's a bit very hard to imagine how much that is because global income is 18 or so trillion a year, right? And more than that is in just this market in US treasuries. And because it's such a vast market, it's possible to buy and sell in the market without affecting the price of what you're buying or selling, right? So if I've got, if I want to sell bonds, uh, I'm able to sell them without worrying that the price of the bonds will fall when I make those sales, right? If I'm in a smaller market, say for tomatoes or something, if I dump more tomatoes on the market and try to sell them, I could depress the price of tomatoes and lose uh, and lose the income that I hope to generate from it. Not so with the treasuries market. I can play in that easily because you know bond prices don't don't move when I make my sale essentially or when an institution makes sales. But in March 2020, that no longer happened. The whole market fell. Everybody sold their bonds. Everybody wanted to sell. Everybody wanted to mobilize cash. Everybody needed money, cash in the banks. They couldn't hold assets any longer. They needed cash. Why? Well, because first of all, the stock market had failed, was beginning to fail. Stock prices had fell, so their stocks weren't they were going to have to cash out of those stocks. Uh, corporate bonds were, you know, corporate companies who were going to lose money because of this virus. Those, those were falling and they wanted to sell those bonds quickly and get the cash. And, you know, they weren't able to get cash quickly enough. And so they began selling their treasuries, their bonds, their US treasury bonds. And suddenly everybody was a seller and they weren't buyers. This has never happened. This has never happened in the history of the US treasuries market. And of course, because everyone was sellers and, and no, not buyers, the prices uh, fell dramatically and interest rates rose. Now at the height of a pandemic, when everybody is scurrying around and governments are having to think about spending to hold up the global economy, interest rates go through the roof, right? This could not be tolerated. And so to cut a very long story short, what happens is, and I mean, what happened then was strangely enough, even while that the treasury market was failing, the US dollar was rising. And I, I feel quite strongly about this because I'm South African born. And I watched as my country's currency collapsed and the, 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 the currency in which they repay their debts and the currency they have to use to buy oil and the currency that they have to use to buy pharmaceuticals just kept shooting upwards, right? Just as their currencies collapsed relative to money flooded out of South Africa and aimed straight to Wall Street, right? Currency fell and the dollar rose, right? It was, and, and then central banks found they were short of dollars central banks in Europe, central banks in South Africa, around the world were short of dollars. Where were they going to get dollars from? And so the Fed moved in slowly first. It took a week, actually. It took 10 days for the Fed actually to fully grasp the scale of the crisis. And they began pumping liquid. They began buying everybody's assets. So if you had lousy bonds on your balance sheet or, or, or falling stock market shares or a bad corporate debt, the the Fed absorbed it all onto their balance sheet and gave you cash in it, effectively in exchange, liquidity. And it wasn't actually cash. It was like an overdraft, essentially. If you think of what the, the Fed provides, it's a kind of overdraft, right? 
and and they poured out trillions trillions of dollars in liquidity not just to the market wall street market not just to the markets in the world but also to central banks in swap lines they swap dollars for swiss francs and and south african rat well i think south africa was a beneficiary no south africa wasn't a beneficiary at the beginning she was later so uh, they they swapped uh, the currency for dollars so that the fed began to, pushing dollars out to the rest of the world. The Fed became the government of the world, not just, not just this, the central bank of the world, but the government of the world, right? Meantime, <laughs> Donald Trump was at the helm of the United States of America, and he was trashing uh, the governor of the Federal Reserve, and he was trashing whatever he could, and then he announced he was closing the borders just to make things worse in that week. He said, I'm closing all the borders to all foreigners. And he did it without any preparation, of course, or anything subtle or ingenious like that. So there was chaos, right? And we have to thank uh, the governor of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, for the fact that the whole of the international system survived that. But I want to go on and say that not only do we have to thank a civil servant, a technocrat, um, an unaccountable, unelected uh, technocrat for the survival of the global financial system and the global economy. We also have to thank the economy, the American economy and the taxpayers of the United States of America that give that technocrat, Jerome Powell, his power. You know, whether or not he knows it or not, whether or not we recognize it or not, he would not have that power if the United States did not have a publicly funded and maintained taxation system, which uh, collected, collects tax revenues on a regular basis from the citizens of the United States, from the businesses and the firms of the United States, from those who trade and those and so on and so forth, VAT, you name it, they collect all of those revenues. And it's those revenues which give the Federal Reserve its power give its ability to generate additional liquidity. It's, it's think of what, think of the American economy and of American taxpayers as collateral for this power to create new liquidity. And the same applies here in, in Britain. We have a tax collection system. Now, our tax collection system has got to have two, two characteristics. One, first of all, it has to have employed people because you know, if without employment, people don't pay taxes. Without employment, people can't go shopping. And shoppers, shopkeepers don't make capital gains taxes or whatever taxes they have, or corporate, a corporation tax. So they have to have employment. And furthermore, if they have to have decent incomes because again, without decent incomes, tax revenues are too low. If you have to rely on del Deliveroo cyclists and Uber drivers for your tax revenues, you're going to be in trouble because they are paying a lot of taxes, right? So, so the American economy depends on employment and it depends on a publicly funded institutional system, which is the tax collection system. And, and that tax collection system isn't private. It's a public institution. It's financed by taxpayers and it's upheld by civil servants and the revenues are collected by civil servants, essentially, right? It's that public institution that underpins the Federal Reserve and the Central Bank of Britain and the ECB, even the ECB and the Bank of Japan, right? So without a decent, strong economy, without employment, without decent incomes and without a publicly financed taxation system, it's not possible to have a Federal Reserve to rescue Wall Street in times of crises. The thing about the rescue was that it was totally appropriate. I think it was right. I think um, personally, I think Jerome Powell should be reappointed as governor of the Federal Reserve because what he did was pretty damn heroic and sensible. My problem with it is that it was unconditional, essentially. Right? If it, if it had been me, I would have said, you can have liquidity, Wall Street. Mr. BlackRock, 
uh, hedge funds. Yeah, I'm going to help you out, guys. I'm here to help you out because if, if you fail too badly, millions of people whose pensions are in your uh, in your domain that you're looking after are going to suffer. So I'm going to help. Them. But these are the terms and conditions. Number one, I would have said, thou shalt pay taxes. And you'll pay taxes in the regions where you make profits. And so be it, right? And if you don't do that, sweethearts, you're not getting a bailout. But of course, we didn't say that. We said, no, no, globalization is a wonderful thing. The free market, deregulation, uh, liberalization. That's what we're about. If we can't change that system. That's impossible. No, we have to bail out the private sector. We have to keep de-risking the private sector. And we have to go on with the potential for them to create crises and cause catastrophic failure. That's just inevitable. You know, there's nothing else we can do. That's our attitude. My attitude is the reverse. It's the opposite. No. The system depends on public resources, public institutions, taxpayers, people, ordinary people. Those people ought to have some power and should have some power over the system. Now, the fact that we don't is because we don't have a Roosevelt representing us. We're represented by politicians on the whole that have been corrupted by the financial system. There's very few politicians in the world anywhere that have not been bought. I think the United States Congress is the most explicit and blatant example of corporate lobbying power, right? And of politicians that have no independence, but instead are completely in the pockets of big, powerful corporations who say, sorry, but we're not going to close down our oil fields. And sorry, no, we want to be, we want to be bailed out. And no, you know, we want to do as we please. And yes, we're willing to take risks. And yes, we're going to make capital gains, but you guys are going to pay. Your constituents are going to pay. So, you know, the, the point is this, that it's very, very difficult without those politicians. But one of the reasons why we have these weak and spineless politicians that have been corrupted is because we have a population, a peoples, that don't really understand what's going on. Now, I, I, I want to just be careful the way I express that, because I think the people are well aware of what is going on. And their reaction is... These bastards, you know, that are running my country, that are running the United States, that are running whatever, you know, we are the victims of it. You know, we're being screwed. Let's face it, you know, we've got jobs that don't pay well. We, uh, our share of the global economy has shrunk over time. Labor's share of global income has been shrinking consistently over the last 20 years. We can't get our kids to, you know, can't afford for our children to go to university because we get into, they'll get into enormous debts. We can't afford for our children to buy or find or get, be, to get, to rent a roof over their heads uh, and live sustainably, right? Our living standards are falling. And yet we can see that there's a 1% out of there that are doing really, really well. And we can see the politicians are fueling the 1%, keeping them up going. And we're mad as hell about that. And we're going to vote for Donald Trump or Bolsonaro or, I don't know, the President Orban in Hungary or you know, Erdogan in Turkey or worse, Modi in, uh, in, in India or even President Xi in China. These are strong men who, as in the 1930s, are going to defend the interests of the people. We need a strong man. You know, then in, in the 1930s, the strong man was Hitler. He was going to fight these invisible forces that we didn't understand, couldn't grasp, and that have made us poor. That's the danger. The people are well aware of what is going on. And what is missing is a, a progressive leadership, a, a progressive movement, people who understand how the financial system works and argues for it to be transformed and argues for it to be acting in the interests of the society as a whole and not just the 1%. And there aren't enough of us doing that. There's too few of us doing that. 
and and there's two but there are plenty of people saying yeah no, no, no. donald trump saying yeah yeah they're all bad they're all rotten vote for me and um by the way let me help myself to a few of those goodies too um and i'll look after you right which of course he doesn't and he didn't any more than hitler did so the rise of fascism, the rise of authoritarianism, in my view, is a reaction to this control over our whole international system and economy by a small elite that who are constantly messing it up, endangering, you know, systemically endangering the economy, while at the same time being bailed out by the public sector. So um, if we if <laughs> we want to transform the system in order to tackle a much bigger threat to human civilization, which is climate breakdown and biodiversity collapse, then we're going to need resources. And we know that Mr. BlackRock can't do that. We know that private uh, hedge funds can't do that and don't want to do that. They don't want to take those risks. You know, the thing I, I most despise about free market capitalists is that they're not risk takers. You know, in the old days, you'd, you'd find someone going after a, a lump of gold somewhere and he would really risk his life to get the gold. But no, not today. This doesn't happen. Not only are they not risk takers, but they don't have the resources that the state has to tackle something as big as climate breakdown and uh, biodiversity collapse, just as we cannot rely on the private sector to take us to war. And we never have. We've never done that. And states have always managed to mobilize finance for war. Not always sufficient, not always adequate, but nevertheless, you know, we know that it's the state that we have to act collectively through the state to mobilize the resources to tackle a big threat. So if we want to tackle climate breakdown and, and biodiversity, then it is absolutely urgent that we subordinate the interests of the finance sector to society's interests and to the ecosystem's interests. And if we think it's impossible to do, or we don't even want to think about how to do it, then we have a very big problem. Now, I want to just say that the extent to which the system is corrupted is reflected in a phenomenon that we, we see at the moment. And this will be controversial, I'm quite sure, with younger audiences, which is cryptocurrencies, right? Cryptocurrencies are a complete distortion of the monetary system. And, and they are, if you like, an evolution of this free market ideology of so-called detachment from the state. The whole point about a cryptocurrency is that it, it avoids regulation. Above all, it avoids democratic regulation. That's what it was designed for. It was designed, after all, on the dark web for people who were doing drug dealing, whatever they were doing, and didn't want to, to, to be watched and didn't want to be managed and regulated. But, but fundamentally, the flaw in cryptocurrencies comes down to a misunderstanding of the nature of money. And, you know, that for me is a, the biggest story of all. If you don't understand what money is, then you're likely to make the kind of errors that uh, are made by um, investors in cryptocurrencies. And today we've seen this, this uh, 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 scam with Walmart, and I can't remember which, what, which the currency was, which was supposedly going to be adopted by Walmart, which caused the value of that cryptocurrency to rise by 30 percent and then to fall and whoever was uh, was holding that currency at the time made a gain of 30 percent in a day effortlessly with no trouble whatsoever and then pulled out and walked away with a massive and lots of people 30 percent of the value of that was lost by many many people so so it's a, it's a really utterly sort of uh, fraudulent system but it comes down to a misunderstanding of money and it come down to very orthodox mainstream neoclassical definition of money, which is that money is like a commodity. It's, it's a thing and we use it to exchange goods and services, to undertake transactions, right? And we have to have it in order to have these transactions, in order to do business, right? That is barter. Um, that is what pawnbrokers do. 
Um, but we evolved 5,000 years ago. Anyone who's read David Graeber's wonderful book on debt, the first 5,000 years. 5,000 years ago, we had credit systems and money is credit. Money is nothing more than a social agreement, a promise to pay. And we have a symbol for that agreement. You know, it can be, could be this coin. This coin is symbolic. It's not my prom it's not, it's not my promise. It's a symbol of my promise, right? It's money because it symbolizes the thing that I promised to pay this in exchange for half a half a cup of espresso, right? So, so that's that's what money is. It's a social construct represented by often quite tangible things like bank notes or credit notes or whatever, right? By a debit card. You know, when I wave a debit card at a coffee machine in the mornings, all it's doing is saying you can trust Anne Pettiford to pay for her coffee because this is her promise to pay. And we're linking you electronically to the bank who will back up that promise and say, yeah, she's got enough money in the bank for her to pay for her coffee. That's all it is. The promise to pay comes from me, right? But if you turn money into a commodity, if you make it a thing in the way that the cryptos do, Bitcoin is a thing and there's only this number of them, no more. And that's why the value of it rises because it's finite, there are limited numbers of them and it's a thing. And you have to get, you mine it with your computer, use up, burn up loads of energy to mine this thing. And then it has value. A Bitcoin has absolutely no value whatsoever, except the one that we project onto it, really. There's no value. At least gold has some value. You could melt it and you could turn it into some jewelry if you needed to and have a tooth replaced with it. Bitcoin has nothing like that kind of value, right? So, but it's based on this old fashioned idea of money as barter, as a commodity that you barter for something else, right? And so um, it's that misunderstanding, which is widespread in economics of what the nature of money is, that has caused the growth of this, what I consider fraudulent uh, cryptocurrency system. Where I can't understand why the regulators have allowed it to proliferate the way it does. Uh, there'll be a revolution in El Salvador because it's going to become the, the president tries to make it the currency for that. And, and people understand instinctively, they know the resistance to what the president of El Salvador is trying to do is extraordinary, given, you know, these people aren't, I imagine, a well-trained economist from Harvard. Not that they fully understand what's going on, but there you go. So, you know, we have a really big problem. We have a, a out, of, out of control, deregulated total financial system, which causes periodically causes catastrophic failure and then has to be bailed out by the taxpayer, the public sector. And then it repeats itself and we go all over again. 2008 is not a long time ago, 12 years between 2008 and 2020, right? And it's going to be less time before the next crisis comes. And we sit here and say, sorry, you can't change it. It's not possible. No, it's too difficult. Well, we can't do it. That's not, in my view, the right attitude to take. It's a form of defeatism. It's a form of acceptance. And in its place, we will get this awful rise, this awful corruption of politics and of um, and the rise of authoritarianism. As people try, you know, Carl Polanyi famously argued that if the, the market inflicts pain and suffering and losses on the public, the public will look for a strong man to protect them from the market, right? And that strong man will be anti-market ultimately. You know, they're authoritarians. They're not, they don't believe in liberal, liberal values at all, but the people believe that they'll protect them. And that's what's the cause of the rise of Hitler, because we had deregulated finance capital going crazy in the 1920s and 30s and causing mayhem and unemployment and catastrophe were the result. And people looked for a strong man and they found Hitler. So, so, so Polanyi had a really powerful point. These are my arguments for why I think, and I hope I haven't gone on for too long, having promised not to, it's really important for us to begin to think about how we manage and 
regulate the global financial system. And I haven't started to talk about what we need to do that. Um, but I'm very happy to, to talk about that. Uh, number one on my list will be capital controls. We have to manage the movement of capital across borders. So I'm going to stop at that point, David, because I'm quite sure that by now I will have annoyed some people um, and that there'll be questions to, to be asked. Thank you and very very much for this presentation. I think that we all have the opportunity to be here discussing with you and that's a big thing for us in EPOC, especially because we are trying everyone to face the issues that you have raised in this very short presentation, but also in a quite interesting way, tackling a lot of aspects of the transition. That's mainly what EPOC is about and we are still trying to understand how can we contribute to it. But I think that this dialogue that we will have here will be very interesting. We will start basically by trying to answer your question. And that's something that you did in the first 30 seconds of the discussion. And we know that we can transform the global financial system. Uh, the question that we would like to pose is how and uh, what kind of power coalitions and what kind of power uh, interpretations we actually have to do it. So we do three uh, short comments on it, and then we would like to open for discussions and to welcome all of your contributions uh, to it. Um, um, so we will discuss uh, basically the paper, the blog that was out in the Transnational Institute, the latent un unused power of citizens and production of public collateral. Uh, this is a text which is quite open uh, in terms of language and very accessible. Uh, it's also one text which tries to uh, tackle the problems of financialized capitalism and what are the alternatives for uh, solving and tackling these problems. Um, it facilitates the spread of economic theory because it's not specifically adopting uh, a lot of references into the academic world, but also relating to uh, NP4's effort to popularize and make economics into a socially relevant um, uh, theory and, and a socially relevant discipline. So we would like to start just with two important extracts and then we can focus into the specific points. The first one is that the citizens' latent and untapped power in countries with sound taxation systems can be used to transform the balance of power between the people and the private finance sector. Its power lies, it is the power that lies in a being repressed by the dominant money class. And the first step for this transition for actually tackling and transforming the financial system is by understanding and transforming the understanding of the economy, understanding how taxpayers can guarantee and endorse the activities of the globalized regulated private financial system must be more widespread. And for us to tackle these uh, specific um, considerations, we would like to focus on three aspects of the transformation. First, uh, we will start by a theory of money and the understanding of money. Uh, this will be presented by Theodore. Then we go by the understanding of austerity and public debt as common collateral. I will be presenting this. And uh, later we'll be on with Valentin uh, talking a little bit more on the alternatives for a Green New Deal. So without further ado, we can begin with that. Yeah, and is it okay if I stand and then I can speak? Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you, Joao, and thank you, Anne, for the really stimulating presentation. Um, so the theme that I'm going to take up is uh, the political analysis, um, specifically mm -hmm. its theory of political change and the way in which the financial sector uh, could or can be directed towards the social and economic good. Um, and so what's really interesting about this is that uh, this political analysis, I mean, as we just heard, is linked directly from its um, economic analysis. Um, so that's the theory of money, the role of the state and central bank, and ultimately the role of taxpayers uh, and the people who use the money uh, in their daily lives. Um, oh yeah, so now we're on that slide, perfect. Uh, so, um, as we heard, there's kind of a series of points about the reality of credit money. Um, and so, as many of us have studied uh, already in this program, this is a common theme in both post-Keynesianism uh, post as well as MMT. Um, as an example of this, we could look, I just put a diagram here from one of the more popular textbooks of post-Keynesian economics. We don't need to look at the detail really, but uh, essentially it shows how commercial banks at a markup over the central bank rate 
um, and that leads to an increase in deposits and that in turn leads to an increase in reserves. Um, and the main point is rather than money being exogenous, it becomes endogenous. Um, but of course, in terms of the presentation from um, um, Ms. Pettifor, um, her thinking goes beyond this and she really thinks about the underpinnings of uh, the, social, the social underpinnings um, and the institutional underpinnings of this. Uh, so yes, commercial banks trade credit uh, every time a borrower promises to pay, but the state here is key because regulation ensures that trust between banker uh, and borrower is enforced. And moreover, the central bank plays a key role in issuing the currency, um, which uh, of course is argued is backed by the collateral of citizens tax revenues. And so I'll just go to the next slide here. Uh, so with all that in mind, uh, we have this theory of change. Um, and the first step, as we heard, is, uh, is understanding. Uh, since, quote, people cannot act to transform what they do not understand. Uh, and from there, we have this idea that citizens can use their latent power to regulate and subordinate the globalized financial sector to the interests of society as a whole. Uh, and so when we're in this context, this is where it raised a number of questions for me. Uh, and I think we can sort of maybe test what the limits of the argument are, as well as maybe ask, have an invitation to discuss them further. Um, so in the article, um, it was pointed out uh, rightly, I think, that the traditional parties of the left absolutely failed uh, when it came to the global financial crisis. Uh, moreover, even before that, during the period of neoliberalism, uh, social democrats, for example, ended up being better at implementing neoliberalism than actually reforming capitalism, um, you know, which was their historic aim. Um, so in my mind, this sort of begs the question of, you know, what sort of engagement with electoral politics could there be? Um, is there a new form of political party that needs to arise or, or is there, is it a question of kind of, uh, um, revitalizing old parties? Um, moreover, uh, when we think about the sort of, um, the impacts of quantitative easing and emergency monetary policy. Another issue is that uh, there are people who benefit from that. Um, at least in many countries, QE has led to um, asset price inflation, particularly with housing. Uh, so that means that there's a constituency of people who in the short run at least have an interest in this current system. Um, and so politically, how could we forge a coalition that would uh, maybe persuade them to think otherwise? Um, and then actually from the lecture today, uh, a third question uh, arose uh, in my mind, which was, you know, if um, the direction is a social movement, um, is the idea is that these terms and conditions can only be implemented during a crisis itself, essentially shock, shock therapy, uh, but you know, for the common good, uh, or is this something that could be developed, you know, uh, as a longer, longer term process? Uh, so thank you, and I'll move to uh, Joao's, Joao's next. Well, uh, we can also focus our attention in the debate whether debt and austerity should actually be related uh, from a neoclassical or a neoliberal point of view, or we can actually have alternatives to that discourse that alternatives are not disponible, they are not available by the table. And we will be basically looking at the idea that, as Anne has already mentioned, that collateral is the basis of, an, of the financial system and public collateral has the basis in the taxpayers' money and also in institutions of the society, such as the labor market and such as decent jobs and incomes. So in a sense, uh, we will focus on the idea that out Austerity is a failed concept and has already been failed uh, after the global financial crisis. But the idea that balancing the books as a necessary strategy can also be applied to the corona crisis, as we have already discussed with the um, failure of the um, American, North, North American uh, tre treasure uh, market. So um, in a sense, what I would like to call attention to this is the idea that uh, quantitative easing and the reversal back into austerity um, was a massive loss opportunity to engage public citizens in public finance. Uh, this actually has uh, happened in the form of the Occupy Wall Street movement, but we see that 12 years after the crisis, we have uh, still a lot of issues to um, discuss 
discuss and engage citizens within uh, the incoherence of our study, both in the long run and in the short run. So in a sense, um, the double standards that characterize uh, neoclassical and um, neoliberal economics are interest, uh, in a sense that you have expansion of finance for uh, private uh, finance and or especially rentiers and a contractor for the public sector in a moment in which you have uh, the need for a fiscal exemption, uh, expansion are uh, a contradiction of the economics profession in itself. And if we understand austerity as a socially failed and potentially dangerous policy, we can also understand that austerity can actually uh, boost and crowd in a create the creation of unsafe private debts. And that is exactly what we will understand in the market of repos, but also in the shadow banking and an increasing of shadow banking uh, as a whole. Um, I will also focus in one of the topics that we have been speaking about, uh, the idea of de-risking. And that's for me a very uh, important topic that we would like, um, maybe we can have the discussion on it. I would very much like to ask a question on it now, uh, that there is a need for transforming the global financial system. And that's one, something that free markets actually, uh, free markets is, they, they do recognize. But what kind of transformation is that? Is that the state which would be uh, necessary for de-risking projects? And then that's the um, um, diagram created by Daniela Gaber in her um, theory of um, from Washington consensus to the Wall Street consensus. And in that, um, in that uh, understanding, uh, the state by public funding is kind of a last um, option, the, the last, but um, there are a lot of steps before of it which actually should be taken before. So for instance, environmental and social guarantee should be aligned uh, with uh, the idea that private financing is the key for most of the projects, but it has to be backed upon um, the state collateral in that sense. So uh, there is a question whether we, we, how to understand the importance of the public debt, but also if we are um, this new Wall Street consensus, um, which could be developing after COVID, if it implies the finance for development that we understand that maybe the IMF has done uh, COVID packages for simulating uh, the recovery of the economy, but if it actually impl implies finance for development or the development of finance. And one question that I would like to maybe pose in this, quite in this topic is the idea that your work has already been engaged a lot with the anti-debt uh, um, campaign in the 2000s. And I would like to know maybe how can economies and economics, um, sorry, economists, uh, critical ones, actually um, engage in the campaign for this COVID crisis because it will be very difficult to understand and explain to the public because it's actually incoherent that austerity has to be put back in the agenda after we, we go back to uh, from 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 recovery. So in a sense, how can we mobilize an anti-debt campaign after COVID? And this is one of the questions that we would like to bring to the table. Sure. And I'll give the word to Valentin for the Green New Deal. Okay. Thank you very much, Raul. Thank you very much, Fyodor. I will now talk about the case for a Green New Deal, which is by no, no mean a coincidence that this is also the title of Anne Petitfo's new book. I hope to build kind of a bridge so we can talk about like visions or future or the future. And in this, I will present the financial system for the Green New Deal, pretty much leaving off where Anne stopped, only touching briefly, of course, the dream of a steady state economy and the conditions um, for this Green New Deal. So the Green New Deal is basically a demand for systemic economic and ecological change. Uh, and looking upon the vision presented in the book of Anne for. Uh, and borrowing words by Vishwa Satgar, uh, eco-socialist nation building project. So let's go. Um, the financial system for the Green New Deal is, as Anne Petit already mentioned, defined by, by the management of capital mobility. Uh, and just to really impress this statement, this means heavily international uh, capital restrictions, mo mobility restrictions. Um, and here, uh, the book really is strongly against the defeatist attitude because doing nothing is apparently also not the adult thing to do. In this system, central bankers would work as gatekeepers to manage international flows of capital. Uh, those, inter those international flows of capital are usually reinforced by private investors. This reinforcement of those streams is not only one of the deadliest weapons of the private financial system, but also those private investors 
are not accountable for the effect of those flows, but only for the financial gains they're able to extract from them. Additionally, um, central banks should only be allowed to sell bonds to members of something like a green club. So if we were able to uh, go this far and also to harmonize monetary and fiscal policy, we could use four channels of financing to go towards something of a green transition uh, and pursue our vision. Those four channels would be monetary credit creation, so adding money to the publicly held stock, loan finance, drawing on the money stock of the government, tax revenues, withdrawing money from the system, or additionally use surplus resources of savers by guaranteeing them bond issues via a national or green investment bank. Um, just to give a little bit of a scale here, the IMF uh, estimates the cost for the transition about $19 trillion in the next 15 years. Uh, and this would be in no means impossible, for no means impossible, uh, impossible to be financed, even not touching upon the fourth, uh, the fourth possibility. Talking about monetary theory. Uh, it is proposed that we should tighten credit regulation rather than working with interest rates, uh, because that was leave, would leave us with a somewhat functional monetary system without getting overburdened by the cost of debt in our economies. If we were able to do this, the grand vision envisioned by our lecture today uh, is something around a steady state economy that you base on seven pillars. First of all, it's an outflow inflow model. This is specifically not called a degrowth because Anne Pettifor really doesn't like that word because it reinforces the, uh, the growth paradigm. So basically we would estimate levels that are um, sustainable in our economies. And then from there on builds a society that sustains those levels in a, in a long-term way. Limit, limited needs rather than limitless wants, uh, self-sufficiency, a mixed market economy, a labor intensive economy, a monetary and fiscal coordination, and we need to abandon the infinite expansion delusion. Of course, those are all umbrella terms that I just touched upon. Uh, but to achieve this, we would need courage and leadership. And as Anne was mentioning in the beginning, a rapid transition is indeed possible. I want to finish my section by a short quote of Greta Thunberg, where the climate, uh, climate conference, she was saying that this problem is so pressing that we should use cathedral thinking, meaning building the foundations today and thinking about the roof tomorrow. And the question I want to pose for Anne, um, you can see here at number three, I want to ask Anne Petty for the activist, having dealt with all those international institutions and also uh, knowing the power dynamics from within. Um, I would like to see where you see the most fertile grounds um, in the institutional framework for a green transition. And maybe those institutions you mentioned in your book, like green banks or clearing unions, international clearing unions, where do you see the structures which are most prone to give birth to those? And thank you very much for being with us today and we kick off the discussion. Now. Well, first of all, thank you ever so much for um, the courtesy with which you've <laughs> tackled that, that, that those articles and that work and the extent to which you have tried to make sense of what I've written. Uh, I'm very grateful for that. I'd quite like to have those last series of questions up on, if that's possible. I just managed to get some of them written down, David, but uh, not all of them. Is it still possible still to share that last slide, perhaps? And while, while that's happening, perhaps I can say this. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, 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 my, my background is that I helped to mobilize an international movement for the cancellation of the debts of some of the poorest countries in the world. And, you know, it was a really hard campaign that it had to be global. It, we had to work uh, north, south, east, west. We had to work in creditor countries, but also in debtor countries. We had to build alliances and coalitions to challenge, uh, first of all, the IMF, the World Bank, but also, the big creditors, which were the Western governments, essentially, Western treasuries. So I know this is possible. When we started, everybody said, well, it's crazy, you can't do that, it's too complicated. And the thing they said was most striking was you can't expect people to understand 
the international monetary system and how sovereign debt operates and how sovereign debt, uh, the resolution of sovereign debt crises might, uh, it happens. And you, you can't, and we were, they were wrong. People perfectly capable of understanding what was going on it once it was explained to them. And once they understood, they were mad as hell and they began to act and to organize. Um, you know, over time we managed to raise some money, but it was tiny, tiny, tiny. Mainly what we did was we mobilized. So for me, education and understanding is a really very powerful tool. Um, and uh, I don't want, uh, I think people sometimes dismiss it, understanding as being, oh, you know, I don't, it, it's a big, big deal. You know, I remember very well a treasury official coming to me one day and showing me a letter from a woman who was writing to ask why the treasury had chosen a particular cutoff date for the resolution of Uganda's debt and had chosen the year 1981 as the cutoff date for the debt uh, negotiations. And, and she challenged this and said, you, you know, this is unacceptable. And the guy showed me this letter, it was a pink letter, and it had a bunch of flowers in the corner. And he said to me, who taught her, who told her about the cutoff date for Uganda's, uh, for the negotiation around New Uganda's debt? I said, well, we told her. We told her that you were unwilling to consider writing off the debt pre-1981. You only wanted to write off post-1981 debt, whereas as the pre-1981 debt was, was really costing Uganda a great deal. And we explained to her that was a problem. And it was up to the creditors that had the power to decide, oh, we'll write off this debt, but we won't write off that debt. So I said, it's not rocket science. You don't have to be a genius to understand that, but you do have to have it explained that this is what creditors do behind the scenes when no one's looking. And he was shocked. He was really shocked. You know, this was a woman sitting at her kitchen table with some pink paper with roses in the corner, writing a letter to the chancellor. So, you know, that showed me that it is really possible for people to understand what's going on and uh, we mustn't patronize them. So that's the understanding bit. So what would the political coalition for transforming the financial center look like? I think I think I've failed to say and that I really want to say is that it has to be international, right? We can't do this with individual countries on their own. What we are witnessing at the moment is countries Already, we see the rise of nationalism. We see the rise of borders. We see the rise of boundaries of protectionism. People are saying, uh -uh, I'm going back in my shell. I'm leaving the European Union. I'm voting for Brexit. I'm looking after number one at home, right? And the problem with that strategy, which is a nationalist strategy, is that it, it doesn't solve the problem because the problem is a global system is an international system that operates beyond your boundaries. They're very happy for you to withdraw into your shell as a nation and pretend they don't exist, right? So, so the first necessity for a political coalition is that it has to be international. And, you know, the left has forgotten to be international. Back, you know, in the days of Rosa Luxemburg, they used to sing the Internationale, you know, they wrote 100 years ago, is it 100 years or 150? They drafted the words of the Internationale. They understood you need to have an international coalition. You have to work together in the way we did with Jubilee 2000. We knew you couldn't help Uganda with her debt because she owed money to Japan, but also to the United States, but also to Germany and also to, to Britain. So we had to all work, we had to work with the Japanese, the Americans, the Europeans, the Brits to tackle some aspect of Uganda's debt, right? And equally, the debtors weren't in one place. There were debtors in Latin America, there were debtors in Asia, there was debtors in Africa, right? So, um, and we built an international coalition. We, we had a flag, it was called Jubilee 2000, and we all stood behind that flag. And behind the flag was a, was a demand. Thou shalt cancel the debt by the year 2000. That was our demand. I wanted to make it deeper. I wanted to say, thou shalt change the structure of debt negotiations 
to ensure that the creditor doesn't call all the shots. Make it fair. Have an arbitration process. Get a judge to sit in the middle and say, who lent crazy money to wicked African dictators? If they did, they have to suffer losses, right? And, and the poor people of that uh, the African country don't have to repay. But only an independent judge would say that. But unfortunately, I couldn't persuade the NGOs that we should make that a demand as well. But nevertheless, so um, we had our flag, we had our demand, and we united, and we had a massive impact. We cleared $100 billion of debt for the poorest countries in the world. Now, in global terms, that's peanuts, really. But for those countries, it was a very big deal. So that's why inter an international coalition is number one. And I want to argue this something that my colleague and, and great friend Jeff Tiley has been arguing, is that the current international system has been designed, the architecture of it is designed to suit the 1%, what he calls wealth. And as I think it was Theodore said, you know, the, the people who have benefited from QE because they own assets, right? The world is constructed to suit their interests. Those of, those of us who don't own assets, those of the world people who don't own, who live in rented accommodation, who don't have property or work, works of art or stocks and shares or government bonds, haven't benefited to the same extent, right? So we need a coalition of labor, you know, it's what I broadly call labor, or you can call it the 99% of those people who work by hand or brain and don't make, make their incomes from rent earned from assets, right? They, uh, they make it from a wage. So we need an international coalition of labor, of people who work by hand and brain. Now that means that also within country, we need coalitions uh, for mobilization purposes. And I think that also means we need cross-party coalitions. Here in Britain, we're stuck in our social democracy has collapsed. Um, <clears throat> the Green Party is rising. Um, we need to build alliances across uh, across uh, political parties as well. And that's going, to, uh, that's going to be different in every country, depending on the culture of that country. We're watching the German elections right now, and we can see that there's a necessity for a coalition there. But primarily, the coalition has to be based on the interests of what we will call labor of the 99%. That has to be the, the basis of the coalition. And, and to say that we want to transform the system and make the whole system, the international system, serve the 99%, not the 1%. And if we have that clear in our head, we have the basis for this coalition. So, um, and the other point I want to make is this, and, I, and yes, I, I, I fancy, I think capital controls are absolutely vital. Gov uh, corporations don't have to pay their taxes in a world of capital mobility. So that has to be ended. But, it, you know, capital controls don't mean, you know, there's going to be a bureaucrat sitting on the border saying you can take this money, you can't take that money. Uh, right now, for example, um, the, Central, uh, the Bank of England has insisted that foreigners buying properties in London in particular, in Britain, have to put down a bigger deposit uh, than they used to have to put down. You know, they, they used to have, to, I don't know, put down 2%, they must now put down 10%. And the immediate effect of that was to cool the London property market because, you know, you, you, you couldn't just put down a deposit and leverage borrowing and acquire a fancy London property in Mayfair any longer. You had to actually use more of your own cash, your own as a deposit, as equity in that investment. And that immediately changed the London property market when it, after it happened. So capital controls can take all kinds of forms. They're not just a, a bureaucratic rigid way of, of blocking capital moving across borders, but they are essential if we are to have the autonomy of, of states. And one of the things I didn't touch on in my talks, but I was very glad that it, it came up I think, was it in Anthony's, I can't remember who, and I apologize for that, who's, who raised the question of development and de-risking and Daniela Gabor's thesis of the Wall Street consensus. And that is this, 
The IMF and the World Bank, as I know from my long experience of working on international development, have actively precluded the possibility of governments in the South building their own public institutions. If I've worked in countries like Malawi, Zambia, Tanzania, um, Nigeria, um, where investment in public institutions, as for example, investment in the police, in the criminal justice system, is discouraged, really. Uh, investment in a central bank and, and the creation of a central bank and the institutions that would make an independent, a bank independent is discouraged. And why? The IMF and the World Bank have always, and Wall Street have always argued, it's not necessary for you, Nigeria, or you, Malawi, or you, South Africa, to have your own institutions and to generate your own um, currency um, and build your own uh, autonomy, uh, monetary autonomy, because you can just borrow money from me. You can just borrow dollars from, from Wall Street. You know, save the trouble of building a public institution for uh, upholding contracts. You know, the promise to pay, pay has to be upheld. In Nigeria, they do not have the legal, the judicial systems that uphold contracts. And so they use, they don't, their money does, hasn't got much value, right? Their institutions don't uphold the value of their money. So they use dollars. So they have a dollarized economy, essentially. Same in Latin America. Most Latin American economies are dollarized. They, they rely on the governance of the American public institutions. And the IMF and the World Bank have deliberately undermined the buildup of, of investment in public institutions back home. I want to see South Africa be able to provide enough money to oil the wheels of economic activity within South Africa. Then there comes the problem, South Africa may want to import oil or pharmaceuticals or iPhones, and for which she will need hard currency, right? <clears throat> then the question of trade comes in and the generation of foreign currency from, from trade. But it may be, and this is, comes back to the, the third presenter and the Green New Deal. One of the important things may be that we're going to have to learn to live without having the latest Apple iPhone, without having all these wonderful gadgets. We're going to have to learn to be more self-sufficient as economies. So for South Africa to become more self-sufficient, and I speak because I know South Africa well, it's perfectly capable of being self-sufficient. It is an incredibly rich country in terms of agriculture. And furthermore, it has minerals galore. It has everything it needs to provide its millions of inhabitants with a decent living standard, right? But its whole economy is not oriented towards their needs. It's oriented towards the needs of the global financial system. That's why it's export oriented, because it needs to raise hard currency dollars to repay debts to Wall Street or to whoever they've borrowed from. And it needs you know, to be able to buy Western goods and services. So, um, so I think two things have to happen. Countries have to become more autonomous through public institutions to create their own monetary systems. I've worked in Malawi, you know, the Malawian currency is called the Kwacha. You know, it has no value at all, really. But then Malawi doesn't have a taxation system, doesn't rigorously collect taxes from its citizens on a regular basis. It doesn't create jobs, it doesn't create employment, and therefore, you know, the taxation system, even if it were well developed as a public institution, couldn't collect the revenues needed and so on. So we need to build up public institutions. That will take time, I know. But, but you know, there's plenty of models out there of how to do it. It's dead easy if we only decide it's, it's important to do. And if we use our own local currency to do it with, you know, to employ Nigerian uh, policemen, in Nigerian currency is not a hard thing to do. What has to happen is we've got to prevent those holding dollars from moving their dollars out of the Nigerian economy and stripping it of its value, et cetera. So anyway, I don't want to get too carried away by that. But so autonomy is important, management of capital mobility. And I actually don't like the term control. I prefer the word management to manage those flows to keep them stable. That's all I want to think about. And then in a world of finite ecological resources, 
uh, uh, finite minerals. You know, we live in this delusional world where Elon Musk thinks he can go to the moon because he can just carry on exploiting the Congo for rare earths, rare minerals, right? That is delusional. These, these, these assets are finite. Within those finite, we have to learn to be more self-sufficiency, self-sufficient and to live within those limits, really. Um, and, uh, and what do we do about the, the global South debt discussion? Well, again, you know, um, the, the answer to that, and I, I feel very old and tired by raising this question, is we, we campaigned heavily back in the 2000s for a new system of effectively, and many Southern countries don't like us to use this term, for a bankruptcy procedure. You know, one of the great developments of the capitalist system was in the 18th and 19th centuries when uh, company owners um, found themselves bankrupted for reasons that had nothing to do with their own capabilities, right? There was a warehouse foul, fire or there was a flood that was beyond their control and they lost everything, right? And in the process, the creditor would come to knock on the door and starve them to death in order to get repaid at a time when they had, through no fault of their own, lost money. And this is most eloquently reflected in the novels of Charles Dickens, whose father went to jail, Marshalsea Prison, for not paying his debts. And, and the, the financial elite of that time, it dawned on them that so long as Charles Dickens' father was in jail, he was not being economically active. Better to get him out of jail, back into the street, into a job, active economically, uh, uh, helping businesses make money and paying taxes and things can be balanced out again. So they invented bankruptcy law for this process. And that is a more or less independent and um, a fair process of arbitration between creditors and debtors arbitrated by the state, essentially. We don't have that at an international level. So for me, the next debt campaign shouldn't be, oh, let's be kind to poor countries and cancel their debts, or let's tell rich countries not to be nasty, and or let's tell Wall Street not to be nasty and demand repayment. I, I don't think we should go down there. We want a new framework for the resolution of debt crises. We need a, a fair, just process which is an, a, 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 to do with solvency, essentially, even though countries can't become insolvent, nevertheless. And we, we discussed this, and to my astonishment in 2001, 2002, 3, the IMF proposed something which they called the sovereign debt um, restructuring mechanism, in which they actually, that was an arbitration process. They recognized after the crisis in Argentina that that was the way to deal with the, the debt crisis of the South. Only the question, the problem was that they wanted to be the in charge of the process. <laughs> they wanted to say, we know exactly how much Latin America owes. We know how much Argentina owes and they owe it to us. And we're going to say how much they owe and how much they must pay. And we said, sorry, we like your sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, but we don't like you to run it because you're a creditor. Can't be run by creditors. Can't be run by debtors because debtors can't be trusted either. It's not fair. It needs an independent arbitrator, and so we lost the process of a new structure for resolving debt crises for the South. And I would like to see it restored. Anyway, I think I've talked enough, but I want to thank you ever so much. I hope that was helpful.